membership director with the Colorado Springs Medical Cannabis Council. Thank you all for attending our first uh, mixer of 2013. For those of you that have attended our mixers in the past, we used to hold these monthly all throughout last year. As we move forward and the busy work that we're involved in, we're going to be holding these on a quarterly basis. So please, if you didn't sign in when you came in, please do so so that you can get on our email list so we can notify you of these coming forward. We're going to make them worthwhile, like tonight's, uh, which will be featuring a great panel of uh, some of the leading attorneys across Colorado. I want to give them a chance to introduce them and have them introduce themselves to you. Uh, these guys are great. They work in various areas of law here in Colorado, moving forward with Amendment 64, with medical marijuana, um, and can really bring some excellent perspective for you all as business owners and, of course, uh, constituents in the community who may have concerns, questions moving forward. So as questions pop up, please address them to whoever you wish. Write them on a piece of paper. Get them to Tanya. I'll be moderating those questions and passing this microphone back and forth between these uh, wonderful gentlemen to have your questions answered as, as we go forward. I'm going to go ahead and introduce just here from your left to right. This is Michael Elliott. He's the Executive Director for Medical Marijuana Industry Group. Let him introduce himself here. Rob Corey, a defense attorney. A big defense attorney. He's won a lot of cases um, here in Colorado. <laughs> now that would be the big guy next to you. That's, that's Charles Allen. He uh, serves on our board at the Colorado Springs Medical Cannabis Council. It's an honor work with Charles. Uh, great attorney, has worked a lot of years in the city. And of course, Brian Vicente, if you guys don't know Brian, he's been out here in our mixers before, before Amendment 64, answering questions at that time. He's one of the co-authors of the amendment uh, we have for you here tonight. So Michael, if you'd like to tell the people about who you are and what you do, that'd be wonderful. Hello everyone, uh, Mike Elliott's Executive Director, Medical Marijuana Industry Group. Um, I grew up here in Colorado Springs, went to Air Academy High School, and then uh, uh, I made a career in politics for a while, running political campaigns, uh, went to law school, and then after gr I graduated, that happened to be the same time that uh, the El Paso County Commissioners put a ban of medical marijuana businesses on the ballot here. And uh, so I ran that campaign and we went to victory by, forget what the vote count was, like 90,700 to 90,000, something like that. Uh, and it was a great victory and uh, immediately after that I got uh, uh, I got this job with the medical marijuana industry group, so I've been doing this for about two years now. So, uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Corey. I'm an attorney, and you know, every time I cross that, um, I'm based in Denver, but I cross that border into El Paso County. And um, I just I just tighten up a little bit. <laughs> it's it's tough down here. I mean, you guys are on the front lines of a cultural freedom war, and you know and you are. We are. I, I see some of my favorite faces out here in the audience. People who I had the honor of spending you know day after day in your district courts here, um, watching your DA waste your tax dollars on absolutely frivolous prosecutions that ended in acquittals, um, and you know, but that they continue to, to go at you. And so I decided to come down here to commend you for fighting these battles. It's so much easier to be in Denver and Boulder and you're not, and, but there's, there's, there's something to that too because the medicine that we all love and now the recreational plant that we all also love um, should be all over our state. So I'm, I'm honored to be here, so thanks for inviting me. My name is, my name is Charles Houghton, I'm an attorney also. I've been down in Colorado Springs for 27, 28 years now, so I guess I've been puckered up for that long. Uh, <laughs> I, I often get asked, yeah, tight. Uh, I often get asked how it was that we were able to get medical marijuana accepted in a community that is kind of known for it being conservative uh, nature and with uh, certain religious organizations and all of the military. And uh, the way that we did it was, is we put a, uh, actually the city council put a task force together and virtually everyone in the industry pulled together and showed everyone in town that this industry can thrive, it can survive, and it can do just fine, and it doesn't cause any problems. All it does is make money for the city, 
and uh, alleviate some pain for some patients. And now with the recreational, I think we've got a whole another set of challenges. We also have another set of business opportunities. I want to thank the Cannabis Council for having this event and let me speak. And uh, I think this is going to be a good evening. Thanks, uh, Brian Vicente. I run the nonprofit organization Sensible Colorado. We've been um, agitating and uh, fighting for patients' rights and marijuana reform since 2004. Uh, I also have the, uh, the law firm Vicente Cedarburg. Uh, we have an office in Denver. We actually just opened an office in Boston. Uh, and we both of those offices are, are geared towards you know, helping people implement marijuana and medical marijuana laws. Uh, I did want to. Um, I guess briefly reflect uh, on you know what happened in November. Um, I hope uh, people and I'm sure people in here realize the significance of the, the vote when we were able to secure 55% of the state supporting uh, legalization of marijuana. It's really just a phenomenal thing that has had ripples around our country and around our world. And I'm just really proud and happy to be a Colorado and to be in a place where currently you know adults and forever because it's in our constitution. Adults can, can grow small amounts of marijuana, um, they can possess marijuana, and they're not considered criminals for doing so. So it's, it's really, it's just incredible to be here. Um, I was here several times last year, uh, you know, trumping for your support as, as uh, key stakeholders in this. And I will say that Colorado Springs was an absolute key uh, battleground for the Amendment 64 campaign. I was the co-director and also uh, one of the two authors of the amendment. And, you know, the work we did down here with that local activist uh, like Mark Slaw, um, the folks that helped us out with our post-traumatic stress disorder uh, petition and the rally we had down here, which was just an absolute highlight of that campaign for me. Uh, the fact that we did so well here uh, really just meant the world to us. There were some dispensary owners, um, uh, Mark, excuse me, uh, Bill Conkling and Maggie's Farm uh, donated heavily to the campaign, ran ads in our favor, and we had a lot of other support from here. So I just wanted to, if I could, ask you to give yourselves a round of applause for helping to use <laughs> I was going to just briefly expound upon some of the, you know, what's going on right now with Amendment 64 um, and kind of what we think that the future holds. Um, I would say, uh, you know, the big picture is I think, I think we're kind of getting a green light on moving forward with pretty much all aspects of this. Um, that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't move forward responsibly um, and, and in, a, in a cautious manner. But you know the discussion that, that our allies are having with the federal government, the discussion that elected officials are having with the federal government, it appears that they are in fact going to allow this to move forward. That's the impression we're getting. They haven't set up policy or anything like that. But those are all the signs we're getting. The same discussions we're having with the state government, with the AG, with the governor, it, it all looks like they are accepting the will of 55% of all our voters and allow this to play out. Uh, so basically, you know, what, what's going on is, you know, in November we passed this law. Uh, within a matter of, of weeks, the governor certified it, which, meant, which means that currently, you know, criminal laws have shifted to the point where adults can possess uh, marijuana and can cultivate it. Um, the, the second and third portion of the law um, are currently sort of being hashed out, right? And what we have is the second portion is the regulatory structure in relation to these Amendment 64 stores, uh, also the grows that supply them, as well as kitchens, as well as test, testing facilities. And when we wrote Amendment 64, we laid out a pretty clear timeline on how this needs to be done. <coughs> Looks like that timeline is being followed, um, and we're pretty happy about that. Uh, basically, that timeline involves the, the What's, what's going on is the governor has created this task force. I'm sure some of you have been following this. There's 26 members on it, including members of law enforcement, state legislators, uh, attorneys, activists, etc. cetera. Uh, and they are coming up with a series of, of non-binding resolutions, which will be issued uh, at the end of February in, in the form of a letter to the governor, the AG, and um, the legislature, right? And from that point, the legislature will then do whatever the hell they want. Will they abide by those resolutions? Well, we'll see. I think it may lay a bit of a, some groundwork as to what they're gonna consider or not consider, but you know, the legislature's gonna take this up. And our indications from talking to leadership over there is that they're gonna take this seriously. They understand this passed by a freaking landslide uh, and that they're gonna move forward with it. Now that doesn't mean that there won't be very difficult issues that we as a movement and, and citizens in our state are gonna have to figure out what we wanna do about. I'm sure we're gonna delve into some of those right now, but at a minimum, all the state really has to do and all the voters really ask them to do uh, was to give some money to the Department of Revenue so they can regulate this, 
uh, changed the criminal code to, to legalize marijuana for certain in certain areas, and then um, uh, enact an excise tax on recreational sales, not medical sales. And so my guess is the legislature is going to do quite a bit more than that, uh, get involved in DUID and so forth. But you know this is why we stay vigilant and active at the Capitol. And the third piece, and now I'll, I'll kind of turn things over for a broader discussion or whatever questions, whatever you want to do. I did want to point out that the kind of forgotten piece of Amendment 64 is that we also legalized hemp and made Colorado the first state to legalize hemp. <laughs> The way we drafted the language, which is again in our constitution now, really just calls for the legislature to, um, you know, legalize hemp by the end of 2014, uh, license farmers to read, you know create a registry, license farmers to grow it, etc. Uh, but I'm happy to say that that there's a lot of movement at the Capitol. In fact, uh, Senator Gail Schwartz has filed a bill title to make that happen this year. Jason Love, a good friend of mine, is in the crowd, and maybe if you're interested in hemp, talk to him. Talk. I'm happy to chat with you too, but this is looking like uh, it's going to move forward this session, which would be a great thing for our, our farmers. So uh, that's kind of my little overview. I don't know. Pass it down to Mark. Or... So uh, let, let me give you guys kind of a, a big picture about the task force uh, here. So uh, the task force has been set up by executive order from our governor. Now they created five different working groups. And um, so far, I've got a perfect attendance record at these working group meetings, which means I've basically been doing nothing else uh, since the new year started. But the five working groups here, we've got the regulatory working group, which is taking on how the businesses are going to be regulated, and they've got some other things going on as well. Uh, we've got the consumer safety working group, which uh, this one is, is kind of one to keep your eye on because a lot of the folks like uh, Dr. Thurstone, who is a big uh, opponent of Amendment 64, and a lot of, a lot of the, the drug rehab folks that were against it have been put onto that working group, and uh, they've got ideas in mind like putting potency limits into place, uh, but more reasonably, you know, they're talking about advertising, uh, packaging, labeling, um, a public education campaign, responsible vendor proposal. Uh, so there you go. Uh, there's lots to talk about there as well. Uh, third working group would be the criminal law working group. All of the law enforcement officers got put onto that one. And uh, there's been some rather, I mean, you know, as Brian said, you know, the initial piece that they're supposed to deal with is, is making our, our state criminal law actually uh, conform with Amendment 64. But there's a lot of other I would say rather radical ideas being proposed. I mean, right now we've been hearing all these ideas like uh, uh, let's allow cops to do drug tests and, and pull your blood on the side of the road. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, also, uh, mandatory drug tests for anyone under the age of 18 before you can get a license. That was something brought up. But, and then also DUID has been brought up, which there's this whole battle over whether uh, the task force is going to endorse the five nanogram, it's now permissible inference bill that got uh, recommended by this group called the CCJJ and, it, and it is the bill going forward. It's not going to be per se, it's going to be permissible inference and if you want we can go into details about that a little bit later too. Uh, we've also got the, uh, the local authority and control working group which is really concerned with uh, the power of the localities. And then the fifth working group, which I'm a member of, is uh, on taxes, funding, and civil law. The first thing we took up was banking. Uh, there's more to talk about there. We talked, we, we've taken on the whole employer-employee rights uh, piece. Uh, we took up excise tax, and then you know, also the funding of this whole regulatory framework is going to be through that uh, committee as well. So that's kind of a brief overview of what's happening. Um, we can go into more detail, but uh, I've talked enough for now, so I'll pass it on. Thank you guys for that brief update. Um, I want to go ahead and jump right into the questions since we have so many people here tonight uh, with questions. If you continue to have them, please continue to write them down. Uh, just raise your hand. Tanya can come around and grab those from you so they can get addressed. We're going to run probably for the next uh, hour or so, and if we have a little bit of time afterwards, uh, we'll continue with those questions. The first question I have here is for Charles, and then I'll let uh, Rob take a stab at it as well. Uh, but just getting your different uh, positions about the tactics and the potential of starting a new business under Amendment 64. Well, I think the biggest thing that 
that concerns me right now is Amendment 64 itself allows local jurisdictions to either pass bans either through an ordinance like the El Paso County Commissioners did uh, by referring it to the voters or uh, if the voters initiate a petition. So there's three ways that it can be banned. Amendment 64 also allows local jurisdictions to uh, limit the number. And so the biggest concern that I've been telling people that have been asking me the question, you know, what do we do now? Well, I think what we do now is if we figure out the locations that are likely to allow some form of recreational um, businesses and then start identifying specific buildings or places to be in those jurisdictions. Right now, I don't know what the city of Colorado Springs is going to do. Um, I don't know what other jurisdictions are going to do, and I think we're going to wind up with kind of a patchwork of places that have banned recreational, just like we had a patchwork of places that banned or limited medical. Uh, so before you start sinking tons of money into something, make sure that you're going to be in a jurisdiction that's going to allow it, and certainly don't get yourself saddled with a lease or some other financial obligation that you can't get out of. Uh, make sure that you have an out just in case something bad happens and they change the rules on it. The beauty of <clears throat> Amendment 64 is it is in our state constitution, as Brian said. Nobody owns Amendment 64. It's a freedom that we all enjoy as Coloradans and as citizens. So there are businesses that are limited only by human creativity that are created right now under 64. Now the core business is the retail production and sale of marijuana. That won't kick in until October of this year and possibly a few months after that when the government issues licenses for that. And obviously if you're in the medical business you have an explicit preference to be the first mover in that retail side of it. That's how 64 is designed. But in the meantime, 64 has in it an irrevocable constitutional right, as Brian said, for an adult to grow six plants. It also has a constitutional right for one adult to assist another adult in growing six plants, and there's no limit on that. If you look at the quote from, and I've kind of memorized it, but it's Sergeant Jim Gearhart from the, um, North, the notorious North Metro Drug Task Force. He was quoted in the Denver Post, you can Google it, and he, he's the head of the North Metro Drug Task Force, and he says, in Amendment 64, there is nothing to stop 100 adults from getting together and growing their 600 plants together in a warehouse. That's what Sergeant Jim Gearhart says. That's not Rob Corey, lawyer pushing the envelope. That is the person who is the drug task force head telling us that. And, and he didn't retract the quote. It's out there in the... Uh, in the atmosphere. So I think that the creativity of our movement, which has been so long um, overshadowed by prohibition, has already unleashed itself. And we can, in this room, I'm sure, come up with 20 businesses in the, in the course of five minutes that are not directly retail marijuana sales. You can't sell recreational marijuana right now. That That is not allowed by Amendment 64, but there are so many side businesses uh, that come up and we are really literally only limited by our cre creativity and the other thing to think about too is the beauty of the medical industry is that we built this industry before the government even it, it occurred to the government that such a thing could exist. I mean there were dozens of medical marijuana dispensaries. I see owners in this room who were smart enough, well, actually all of you were smart enough to start it before House Bill 1284, or at least you bought out somebody who was. You wouldn't be in business now. Um, and so the, what the government had to do was regulate an industry that already existed, unlike most of these uh, states where the regulatory framework is set for you and then you have to play within their rules. Amendment 64 creates that yet again for Colorado. We get a second bite at the apple. We get the green rush one more time. And as far as um, you know, strategy of where we should go and all that, again, nobody owns Amendment 64. It is nobody's property. It is all of our property because we're all citizens of this state and we're all governed by the supreme law of our state, which is the 
Colorado Constitution. So I think freedom works, and I think different people with different ideas and, and uh, different ways of approaching things and different passions. I mean, you can take just about any business that exists right now in Colorado and turn it into a cannabis-themed business. <coughs> think about it. I mean, this is, this is a, a miracle plant that I think we all believe in. I think we all believe this plant is a uniquely wonderful thing. And so you take a business like this business right here, this restaurant that we are in, and it's, by the way, this is a wonderful venue. I must commend whoever picked this one. Um, could not this be a cannabis restaurant? Yes. Okay, look at this. See this? This is a, a lethal drug that I just purchased openly in this bar here. Could not, and, and uh, people tell me that hops are closely related to the cannabis plant, that there's a, there's a similarity there. Why couldn't you brew this out of, and, and make it cannabis? You can't sell it, don't sell it, but couldn't you give this away and build a business around that? I mean, the list goes on. I don't want to bore you, and, but let, let your mind unleash itself, because this is a wonderful time to be alive in Colorado and to be a, a cannabis lover. I mean, this, this does not happen again. The end of prohibition will not happen again in your lifetime. It just happened, and you're, and you're here, so take advantage of it. Thank you guys very much. Um, go ahead and go to the next question here for uh, Brian and Mike. Uh, will individual private farmers or growers uh, be permitted to sell commercial marijuana to authorized retailers? Thanks. Um, so I think the, nut, the, the nuts and bolts of that is will we have independent growers, right? Yeah. Um, and the way uh, that we drafted Amendment 64, I think we left that open to you, right? We, we felt like, honestly, at some point, that makes sense. Does it make sense right now? I'm not sure I you know, have a real strong opinion on that. I know people in this room maybe do. Uh, others feel radically the other way. Um, but we, at the end of the day, MEM64 does not have guidance on this, right? It leaves it open. And my guess is that people are going to be fighting um, at the legislature where, you know, this decision is going to be made uh, to keep vertical integration. Some people are going to be fighting to not keep vertical integration. Love to hear from you guys as to what you'd like to see. Um, our, the general campaign's perspective is we're kind of like, we don't really particularly care about this. We think the free market makes sense in the long run. Could there be maybe a couple years of required vertical integration to help support the pre-existing medical people that transfer over and have that system in place? And then maybe a sunset that might make sense. But at the end of the day, it's, it's sort of an open question at this point. So. Uh... What I was doing immediately before coming down here to Colorado Springs is I was at a meeting of the regulatory working group, which this is probably the fifth or so meeting. Uh, and today we spent three hours with uh, Laura Harris, who's the Medical Marijuana Enforcement Division Division Director, uh, Ron Camerzel, who uh, took Matt Cook's and Dan Hartman's position as Senior Director of Enforcement, uh, Representative Daniel Papone, and a number of other folks. And vertical integration was essentially the topic of uh, our three hour long meeting. Um, I'll tell you that uh, the idea of changing things, uh, especially when you look at this task force and the membership of this task force, uh, can be a little terrifying because if you get past the fact that, you know, we're going to not allow vertical integration or not have it anymore, uh, the, the question is, well, what on earth is going to be put into place? And uh, if we're going to strictly regulate marijuana like alcohol, guess what? Vertical integration wouldn't be required, but in some cases it wouldn't even be allowed. And you can imagine a scenario where everyone who just was forced to get married would be forced to get divorced then. Now, I'll tell you that after this meeting today, it appears that that got taken off the table. Uh, but what was being discussed today, which uh, I'm seeing that there was uh, some consent, I don't want to say consensus, but it appeared that there was a majority of people who were thinking that the best way to go ahead was to not require vertical integration, but allow it. So you could stay vertically integrated, but you wouldn't have to. 
Now, if you start thinking, I'll just throw out a couple other issues that, okay, so if that happens, uh, I'll throw out there that, okay, so are we gonna have a, a business that is just a retail business? And I'd like for you to think for a minute about how uh, our, our tax code of 280E would affect a retail-only business and whether that's even a possibility. Yeah, have fun writing that off. Uh, and then think about a grow. If it's just a grow, what exactly does that mean? And what does that mean if, you know, if you're going to stay vertically integrated and uh, if we've got to grow and, and whether it needs to be limited? These are all outstanding questions that we've just started uh, getting into. Um, I think for the most part, my group has been let's uh, not reinvent the wheel. And uh, let's give this a couple years and that vertical integration, uh, we would argue, has been a, uh, a pillar of our program in keeping the feds out of Colorado uh, and uh, I think uh, uh, mitigating many of these public safety issues that people have been concerned about. But you know, at the same time, uh, there, there could be a big change coming up. And while I'm talking, uh, I'll kind of end that, and while I'm talking about it, Brian, I'm not sure if you heard this yet too, I know, you'll be quite interested, but there was a vote that was taken today. This was just a straw vote, so not a final vote, over whether uh, consumers could be out-of-state residents. Mm. And I was rather shocked that there was about 13 people on this committee, and only one person said that out-of-state people should not be allowed, right. meaning that 12 people, well, let me say that there were some abstentions, right. some people didn't vote on it. But uh, I think there was nine or 10 people who said out-of-state people should be able to vote at these businesses. And I gotta tell you, that was not what I was expecting to see. Yeah. All right, I'll pass it back. I mean, that's uh, the whole tourism question, which is, is great. But, you know, to follow up on what Mike was saying at that last meeting too, uh, Christian Cedarberg works with Brian, um, also helped co-author the, the amendment. I actually came forward and, and kind of read that, that working group, the legal definition behind the persons that will be able to purchase from this, uh, from this, this new retail model. And under the amendment, persons is defined as any adult 21 and up, not with a Colorado ID or any other caveat. So it is interesting that they are taking that position and, and actually understanding the law. So that's great, win-win. I um, want to touch briefly here on the next question. Um, this one's for Brian and then Charles. Why have uh, localities been able to ban Amendment 64 businesses without a referendum or public vote that is required in the Amendment 64 language? And I think maybe this might be a little misunderstanding um, as far as the, the, um, the, the question goes, but I'll let you guys enlighten people about the difference between voting and, and a referendum that way by the people. Thanks. Yeah, one of the sort of, you know, bargains you make when you have to write legislation that you want to pass, which was our goal with Amendment 64, not just to make a statement, uh, I mean, you just have to make some degree of uh, allowances to the other side, right? I would, you know, and we decided to, to call this campaign the campaign to regulate marijuana like alcohol. At the end of the day, you can have dry counties in Colorado. There are places that really don't want marijuana or alcohol, you know, they can in fact legislate themselves out of that. So, you know, I, I believe uh, over the long term, we're gonna see most areas of this state allow for these recreational stores. But uh, the way we drafted it, just to be very clear, is it does allow communities to opt out, right? And that could be done uh, in a couple ways. One, it could be done by action of that local government body. So in Colorado Springs, be the city council, in, in the El Paso County, be the county commissioners, uh, they can opt out and say we well, are not going to have these stores, and or they could limit the number of stores. They have basically a large degree of local control, right? Now it can also be done via a ballot initiative or a vote of the people, right? And if you look at all the medical marijuana bans, you've seen a lot of like votes of the people where they banned them. Fortunately, here they did not. But Grand Junction, Fort Collins, blah blah blah. And so keeping this in mind and having worked on many of these uh, campaigns to prevent these bans, the way we drafted this, I think, is somewhat sly in that uh, the vote of the people to ban these stores can only happen in even year general elections, right? Now why do we always lose on the medical marijuana bans? Because they're on like the January 2011 ballot, right? And who votes in January 2011 in Grand Junction? It's like 25 old people, right? It's like not us, right? it's not, not people, not, it's not reflective of the public. 
Uh, and, and so therefore, that vote could not occur, right, around recreational. That would have to be an even year general election, and we win, generally, in even year general elections, much larger turnout, especially if it's presidential, which is why we won this past year. So that's kind of the, the framework for how it is. And yes, we are seeing some communities ban these. We can always get active and, and fight uh, to try to turn those counselors around. Uh, we can also run ballot initiatives, as we've done in the past, as we did with Amendment 64, to try to put good legislation in at the local level. And Brian brings up a really good point. Just because a local jurisdiction does ban it by way of an ordinance, that doesn't mean that the citizens couldn't put together, if you get enough signatures on a petition, to initiate a uh, vote that would allow the ban to be um, revoked, if you will. Also, too, you have to understand that it's kind of basic Colorado law that one governing body can't go, can't bind another governing body. So, for instance, if El Paso County voted against or voted a ban in place, uh, they could voluntarily pass another ordinance that revokes it and allows recreational marijuana. Would count on that, but uh, a future board of county commissioners could revisit it and pass another ordinance that allows it back in. So as you start looking at these places where the bans are in place, that doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of the story. In my mind, it's the beginning of the story. And if you feel strongly enough about it and you can get enough support behind it, you can change their decision. And so I, you know, I don't want you to think for a minute that just because someone says that jurisdiction banned it, that doesn't mean it's banned forever. Nothing's forever and you can change it. And you have the right under the Colorado Constitution and Colorado law to do that. And I would encourage you to, you know, if it looks like it's a, you know, a, a close vote in some places, see if they'll revisit it. If they won't bid it, revisit it in 2014 and 2016 and, you know, every two years after that and go back after it. You know, this, the, the vote to legalize marijuana for recreational uses didn't happen the first time. It took years to get this done. And so if you live in a jurisdiction where you want to see it happen, it might take years, but don't quit. Yeah, thank you guys very much. Um, this next question is an interesting one, and it kind of relates around uh, a little bit of what Rob was saying, and I think you're going to get kind of two different views here on it. Um, and this is for Charles and then Rob. Amendment 64 permits people to do all things approved in Amendment 64 for others. Um, I think they're referring to cultivation, giving it away, uh, 21 of adults. What is the current thinking on this? Could I rent a facility to do this, say, for 50 people? And this is something that I think Charles and Rob might differ maybe a little bit on. There you go. Well, he said you have to go first. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'll go first, and I'll take the constitutionalist view. And by the way, I mean, Amendment 64 is very well written, and all of you should read it yourselves. I mean, it's designed not necessarily for lawyers to read it and then tell you what it means. I mean, we're not the, the papal authorities on our Constitution. It, it, it's accessible to all people, so read it yourself, and it is very well drafted. And what it creates is an individual right of an adult to possess marijuana and to grow it. And you get to grow six plants as an adult. There's no red card necessary. This is every single adult who enters the jurisdiction of Colorado. Don't even have to be a Colorado resident. You don't have to have a Colorado driver's license. You enter into our state, you have a right to all of the rights that are under our Constitution. And that's axiomatic. That's not a marijuana unique thing. So Amendment 64 explicitly says that you have a right to assist another adult in the exercise of the rights that are created by Amendment 64, period. So one adult can assist another adult in the exercise of the right. And there is nothing in Amendment 64 that prevents 50 adults from getting together right now, currently, as the laws now exist, and growing their six plants collectively. Amendment 64 was specifically designed that way, and it was sold to the voters quite effectively as the alcohol 
Marijuana Equalization Initiative. All right? There's nothing that prevents 50 adults from getting together and brewing beer together. You can do that together. This is America. People get together and we do things. We have, we have a U.S. constitutional right of association. That is inalienable. That's in the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. It cannot be repealed. We have a right to associate with each other. This gathering is an example of that. The government cannot ban gatherings like this. It could not do it. No government. And I don't care if the county commissioners of El Paso decide they don't want us to get together and talk about marijuana. They could not ban this, and they wouldn't even bother trying. But if they tried, they would be sued faster than their heads could spin, and they would lose. That's a guarantee. So Amendment 64 does create this individual right, and it's, it, it is at this point unregulated. Here's the interesting point. There will come a time, most likely, when uh, a minority of powerful individuals are offended by a bunch of Americans getting together and exercising our freedoms, and these minority of powerful individuals tend to be politicians, prosecutors, that kind of thing. I mean, in, in my view, anybody who has power is automatically suspect because if you have power, you cut ethical corners to get that power. That's Thomas Jefferson. That don't, that's not me. That's Thomas Jefferson designed our government with that in mind. If you have power, you are automatically ethically suspect because you got that power through unethical means, by definition. So there will be people who are offended by a bunch of uh, Coloradans getting together and growing our marijuana together, but the bottom line is they can't stop us now. Eventually they may try to over-regulate it and create uh, barriers to that, like they tried to do with the five patient caregiver thing that we, Brian and I, successfully sued and struck down in Denver District Court, which unleashed this industry back in 2007. So that, that they may try to do that, and we will be there to respond to that. Um, but right now, you have the ability to associate, get together, and if you do it now before the government stops you, then you have an additional uh, argument that you're grandfathered in, you, and you continue to do it. And if you have, if you have a foothold now, now is the time to get that foothold. If you wait for the legislature to give you permission, that permission is not forthcoming. They'll not give you permission. I, I, I'm pretty sure the legislature will not say, yes, please, get together 200 adults and grow together. They won't give you that affirmative permission, but Americans don't ask for permission before we exercise our freedoms. You have that freedom now. Take it now. Freedom is a muscle. If you don't use that muscle, it atrophies and you lose it. So now is the time. Okay, now for something completely different. <laughs> Rob and I disagree on some things on a regular basis and it doesn't mean that he's wrong and I'm right. We just have a different take on it. My biggest concern is, is that if you join together, um, right now, under the recreational model, there's not supposed to be any remuneration between uh, people who are over 21. You can give the product away to someone, you can receive it from someone who's over 21 as long as it's less than an ounce. The um, uh, amendment specifically provides that if you overproduce, if you will, the excess medicine, or marijuana in this case, the excess marijuana can be stored in the same location where it's grown, uh, and that is not a violation. There's no plant count, or excuse me, no ounce count on that as far as I can see built into the amendment. The problem that I've got is, is that if you have a collective or a group of people that uh, are all growing together and you happen to be standing there when you have a law enforcement encounter, <laughs> They're not liable to believe you that you've got 50 people that are involved in this. Now, can you prove it? Probably. Does that subject you to being arrested, possibly put on trial, possibly convicted? Yeah. So what I, I guess I'm cautious in the sense that until they flesh out those rules, I don't know what the result would be if you had a 
a 300 plant grow and you were the one that was standing there when the cops broke in. Um, I, it's, it's something that's troubling to me. Uh, I wish I had the answer. Uh, I agree with Rob that you know we were built on you know ask forgiveness not permission and so I just think that if you do it you need to be aware of the risk that's associated with it. I'm not saying it's a good idea or a bad idea. I'm just saying that you better be ready for a good explanation when the cops show up. That's all. Um, you know, the people that have power that Rob was talking about, one of the things that he left out, they frequently have badges and guns. <laughs> and, uh, uh, they exercise that power in a way that is not necessarily uh, in exact accordance with the law. And I'm not saying that they're doing anything wrong, but like anything else, there's a matter of interpretation. And uh, if it comes down to a matter of interpretation, my uh, experience has been the guy with the badge and the gun. It's that interpretation usually wins right off the bat. Uh, so I'm just saying, be careful out there if you decide to do this, and remember that you can't you, you can't charge for the medicine. Uh, Rob is correct when he says you're limited by your own creativity as to how you put these things together. Uh, you know how you know how do you pay for the space? You know, who's on the lease, all of those things. There's a lot of different things that could happen. And Amendment 64 does provide a lot of business opportunities, but you just have to be sure that you're okay with the level of risk that might hit you. Since the mic is crossing over, I'm just going to have a brief rebuttal since he made it. <laughs> very brief, very brief. All right, and, and, and Charles makes an excellent point. And, and you, what you want to do if you're going to create one of these is visualize yourself in that point of encounter with law enforcement, because it could happen, all right? And what you do to deal with that, and, and there is no way to eliminate risk in your life. I don't care if you're going into the car wash business or whatever, there, there's always a risk. This carries a very heightened risk, as we all know. But what if you had, 300 adults getting together and you had 300 pages, a one-page document signed by every single one of these adults, notarized, and this is kept in a nice binder. Don't we all do that anyway with our medical marijuana? Don't we have our medical marijuana documents readily available to law enforcement? Haven't we been trained to do that over the past few years? So you have a one-page document signed by your 300 adults and it says, I'm authorizing John Smith to grow for me. Here's a copy of my ID. It's notarized. You give the law enforcement officer, and by the way, always be respectful to these people, even if they don't deserve it. They do have guns, they do have badges. Just be respectful, you know, it doesn't cost you anything. They, they don't deserve your respect, but give it to them anyway. And, and, and give them this binder and say, here are 300 adults, officer, they've signed this, and have three or four copies of it, by the way. Copies are a lot cheaper than the fertilizer and the ingredients and everything else that you buy, the lights and all that. Copies are dirt cheap, and they're worth every penny. Uh, eight cents a copy at Kinko's. So have four of these binders, officer, here it is. And these are 300 adults who signed this document, they notarized it. I have copies of their IDs, they're all over 21. Then, and if you're respectful and reasonable to them, I honestly believe that, you know, they will think about it, and if, if they can only think for two minutes, then they'll just realize, do we really want to go here? I mean, don't, we have, don't we have crime in this community to deal with? I don't know. I mean, he makes an excellent point, and you can paper it up, though. You can paper it up, and the paper <laughs> may save you. It may save you. Not always, but I'm it, sorry. I did, it may I save you. I interviewed a gentleman that had 30 plants. His ex-wife called the police on him on an anonymous hey, tip. Um, good. That was raided by 13 SWAT policemen. He has no charges. So that advice is almost criminal. No charges were even dropped. They broke down the door, injured two of his dogs, burned a hole in the floor, scared and terrified the man. He has PTSD to this day. So based on your advice, so, well, you're saying you can have this stack hey, of papers. And the Casey, I'm going to have to ask you off. just to go please sit down. I can understand that. I mean, what I was going to say in a brief comment is I hope 300 pages can stop a bullet. And I, and I get that. I mean, there is there's that real risk. And I think that that's what both of these attorneys are saying is that it's not quite clear yet in the amendment. It's something that it does come with a greater risk. Uh, obviously, I think most of the people in this room are doing things by the book as so much as he, possible. So is he? No, well, since he's calling sure, me, but it, that's a private caregiver situation. I'd rather not disrupt everybody else's questions right. through this particular issue. If you guys wouldn't mind addressing that perhaps afterwards, 
We'll have round four over there for anybody Please. else who wants to watch. So, thank you. We'll get back to the questions. Back to the questions. You said charges. We are, but I have to ask you to please submit a question like everyone else. Charges weren't filed. American, I can free speech. You said charges weren't filed. Guys, let me, let me right. please come back to the conversation. Charges weren't filed, right? But situation that costs a lot. Okay. Um, this one's for, um, I'm gonna start with Rob on this one. Uh, private clubs opening. This is very similar to this other question. I'm sure you're gonna have very similar points. So please, if we can move through them. I wanna get through the rest of these questions in the next 30 minutes. Um, and you know, uh, what is what is being done? Are we looking at bands possibly coming forward on social clubs? Uh, and then Brian, if you could also address this question, because I don't think the term social club is anywhere in the amendment, and uh, it's certainly something that uh, that is you know what we're seeing uh, kind of part of this creativity process that we keep hearing about. So uh, if you guys want to answer some questions about social clubs, I think it's a big one. It's a great question, and let me disclose first of all, I own a. Um, Social club, you may, have, you may have seen it on O'Reilly Factor or uh, CNN. We got publicity that was way out of proportion to the, the goodness of the club at this point, but that's all right. Um, you know, we, we ran this initiative, we called it the Alcohol Marijuana Equalization Initiative. Here's a radical concept for you. There are these clubs that exist where you can walk in and you can purchase alcohol in a club and you can consume it on the premises. Now, th that's a pretty radical concept, isn't it? It's called a bar. I mean, th there are tens of thousands of these all over the world and there's nothing wrong with it. This is a, a free country. We have every right to pursue happiness and there's nothing wrong with a bar, all right? So we ran an, in an initiative to create something that treats marijuana like alcohol. And if you want to treat marijuana like alcohol, you ought to have a social club, and you ought to be able to have adults in America, a free country, congregate with each other and exchange ideas, conversation, you name it. We've all been to bars, we've enjoyed them. And, and here, here's another thought for, I, I venture to guess that every single person in this room has already probably been to a marijuana club in their lives. What is a marijuana club? It's a bunch of people getting together and passing a joint together and talking. That's pretty much it. It's not a, a very complicated concept and we've all done it and we've probably all enjoyed it and that's why we're sitting here today. So what we did was we stuck a label on it and we did it on New Year's Eve. We tried to capture the traditional alcohol holiday away from uh, the drinkers. And, and by the way, we did have alcohol at our club too. And there's nothing wrong with that. The combination of marijuana and alcohol can be a glorious, wonderful thing. Um, and so, and we're not ashamed of that. And you know, and that's the bottom line about Amendment 64. It unleashes freedom and it stops the shame about marijuana. I mean, at, at some point in our lives, you know, we've all been ashamed. I mean, when I bought my, you know, quarter ounce back in Iowa when I was in high school and it was only $17.50 back then. I mean, it was like the worst dirt weed ever. I was ashamed, you know, that transaction had to take place like next to my locker. It was just this illegal thing. I, I felt dirty about it. Well, we don't have to be ashamed anymore. I mean, we can openly do this, and there's nothing wrong with that. And we, by the way, have 55% of Colorado's voters telling us it's okay. I mean, that, we, we, there is no way to understate the, the beauty of that. 55% of the voters of this state have said, we want this legalized, we want to treat it like alcohol. We got more votes than Barack Obama received in Colorado. 50,000 more votes for marijuana. Marijuana is more popular than President Barack Obama. And don't think the feds don't notice that. Don't think they don't notice that. They are politicians. That, that is their lifeblood votes. Did you hear anything from the federal government during the Amendment 64 campaign about Amendment 64? Did you hear anything? No. Because I sure didn't and I was watching. Have you heard anything since Amendment 64 passed from the federal government other than the one thing that Barack Obama said, which is very encouraging, and I commend him. He said, we have bigger fish to fry, and he was 
100% right. I mean, I sure hope my government fighting a global war on terror has better things to do than care about some guy in his basement smoking a joint of a harmless medicinal herb. I mean, I have to think that. So I'll, I'll get off my soapbox here, but, you know, the club idea is so simple and so basic. I hope we see hundreds of them, and I hope we see them before the government decides to try to ban it. They'll fail. They, they won't ban it. They tried to ban dispensaries. The architects of vertical integration, by the way, which was House Bill 1284, the architect of that said, he, actually, he was quite honest. Senator uh, Romer, the son of the governor, I mean, he was pretty honest about his intentions. He wanted to put 80% of you out of business. I mean, he didn't, yeah. he didn't hide that. You know, that was his view. He called you thugs and knuckleheads. And he said, we're gonna send auditors with guns out after you. I mean, he, he was quite honest. Did he succeed? I, I think he put a lot of us out of business, not 80%. So, I mean, that, that's the motivation behind these kinds of things. And the club idea is, it's, it's so simple. And, and you know, we did, it, it was a beautiful thing when we had that club too. It was, it was, a, it was a wonderful night. It was, a, it was, a, it was just, a, just the best way to ring in uh, 2013. I, I couldn't think of a better way. My friends heard about it in Iowa. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, so getting back to getting to the issue of private clubs, Rob and I have somewhat similar and somewhat different views on this. Uh, in drafting Amendment 64, uh, you know, we absolutely did foresee uh, private clubs happening at some point, right? And we did not put language in there to restrict, to not allow them. Um, the broader issue, which is where Rob and I diverge, is I working in the trenches every day to try to get this law implemented in a way that, that damages as few people as possible and that helps as many businesses as possible, have to deal with the, the backlash when people move in, in a very quick fashion, right? So what I'm trying to stress, and I maybe come out a little harsh here, but Rob and I disagree on this, is that we need to move forward in a responsible way. Right? And if we are viewed by the state government, by the national government, by uh, the elected officials that I have to work with every day as being responsible and not being kind of crazy party guys on TV, it makes us a lot easier for us to pass laws that help a lot of people. You know? So, you know, the press, and honestly, I don't care if people have clubs right now. Like, I, I would never argue those people should end up in court or anything like that. What I have a problem with is going to the press and trying to get on the news in Iowa about this because the press is a very, very valuable tool and it can also be very damaging, right? And, and having worked in this issue for years, the press, for any of you that followed this and been involved, the press for the first like five to eight years of medical marijuana was nothing but like Damien Lagoy and these dying AIDS patients and veterans and people with PTSD. And that's who we fight around and that is how we win over the public to our side, right? And, 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 and when we have these, these sort of, you know, party clubs that are arguably legal, arguably illegal, coming out, you know, within a, a month of the voters passing this, and I get emails the next day from elected officials across the state saying, this, you know, this ain't what I voted for and I'm gonna work against this now because you're rubbing this in people's faces and moving too quick, it makes my job harder. So again, that, that's, that's my view and I'm not trying to damn people that go to clubs or anything. So, anyway, so that, that's the conclusion of my remarks. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, you know that. Let me do a follow-up question real quick because I want to get Charles and Mike's opinion on this. Um, just working with local government, Charles has done a lot, and uh, especially here in our community. And Mike at the task force level. Um, I mean, how how feasible do you think it is for local municipalities to enact some controls or to ban or outright prohibit uh, what Rob would claim is uh, perfectly legal to gather as adults and do legal activities? Well, I think a, a, if there is no money that changes hands during this transaction, I think a local government would find it difficult to enact a set of regulations that works that wouldn't have some sort of flaw in it that could be challenged legally. I mean, you know, we've seen the battle that they've had trying to pass homeless people ordinances and 
Matt trying to ban the passing out of handbills, leaflets. Uh, generally speaking, the government comes out on the losing end of that argument. Um, I, I agree, you know, I, I, I'm sitting in the middle and I kind of agree with both of them. One is, I'm, I understand Brian's dilemma, and that is, is that if you sell someone a program and then all of a sudden it appears that that program isn't what they thought it was, then there's going to be some feelings hurt and they're going to feel like they've been duped. On the other hand, we do live in a free country and I agree with Rob that we should be able to associate it pretty much any way you want to. This is one of those dilemmas that I don't know that there's a clear-cut answer. Um, I know that if a municipality tries to take this on, uh, I think it's going to be a drafting nightmare for them because I don't know how you differentiate the hundred shades of gray that could be built into one of these things. And as soon as they legislate something, someone is going to ask an attorney who's got a half a wit, and they're going to say, well, just do it this way, and you'll get around the regulation. So uh, will they do it? I don't know. Should they do it? Again, I don't know. Uh, I think a lot of you that know me know that I'm kind of a realist. I don't deal with anything but what is. And what it is right now is is that it's kind of wide open. And whether you're in favor or against them, you know, you need to listen to both what Rob had to say and what Brian had to say. You know, it's a, it's a social question that only you guys can answer. So um, I guess if the government starts to step in, and overstep their bounds, that's when I start getting upset and say, well, wait a minute, just because you doesn't like, don't like it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be able to do it. Uh, you know, these are responsible adults that are over 21. Um, if you let them drink alcohol, why wouldn't you let them smoke marijuana? So again, I think it's a, uh, it's a tough question. And if I was on the government side, I'd, I'd be thinking twice about how I how would even go about regulating. So I'm going to kind of second Charles here and, uh, and do a little bit of agreeing with both Brian and Rob. Um, first of all, I'm going to give Rob a big compliment because he does something that I think is, uh, we all need to learn a lesson from. It's, it's using that word freedom. And uh, Not just using the word living it. Yeah. Living it. Well, and let, let, me, uh, let me tell you a concept here. There's this concept called framing. And I don't mean framing like framing someone for a crime. I mean like framing an argument, framing uh, the way that we as a society talk about an issue. And generally when people think about marijuana, the frame that they use is a public safety frame. When they think about marijuana, they think about, they get concerned about kids, they get concerned about cars and, and safe roadways and crime, that sort of thing. And. Uh, what we, I think, in general, want people to think about is freedom. Because uh, when, when they think about marijuana and they think about freedom, well, in a way, it doesn't really matter anymore whether teen marijuana use is going up or down because, hey, we live in a free country. And uh, sometimes, well, really, freedom trumps public safety. I think there's a very good argument for that. And so Rob does something that I actually, I hear very, pretty much nobody else in our movement doing. And it's to say that word freedom and to make it count and to live it and to, uh, and to make that be what people think about. So getting to Brian's point though, uh, you know, my, my organization, we are a trade association and, and what we do is we're a group of business owners that get together and we, we hire lobbyists. We lobby at the city level and at the state level. We, we, we also have a federal lobbyist. And um, we try to get good laws passed. And I would say that we have had a tremendous amount of success in doing so. Uh, we can all sit around here and, and find a million things wrong with our current regulatory framework and say that needs to be adjusted and that needs to be updated and that's overregulation. But what other state would you rather be doing business in? <laughs> So, this is what we do, this is what my group does, and we've done, I think, in a very, very responsible and successful manner, and I think really the problem with the clubs is that they do turn our elected officials against us to a certain extent, and that can change over time. But I think the initial feeling from clubs is that 
They aren't going to be just some people sitting around, you know, uh, sharing a joint, having a jolly old time and not getting into trouble. That it's going to be drug dealing, uncontrolled, and that they're going to be getting on the roads and getting into accidents and killing people. And our kids are going to be showing up there and they're going to be smoking. It's, you know, it's all the public safety worries and it's, uh, that, that's what a lot of people are worried about. And I, I think to a certain extent it's ridiculous. Uh, but the problem is, is that it really matters what our elected officials think, especially now, considering that everything, everything is on the table right now in terms of how this is going to be implemented. And um, especially, I guess, getting all the way back to really what the question was is, you know, what, what, what do localities have the power to do? Well, localities have the power to ban businesses. And if they think that things are out of control, they are going to react and they're going to ban this. And what we're going to be left with is, uh, well, decentralized, no businesses. And, you know, you, you can make an argument that, that maybe that's a good thing. But uh, I would make the argument that we very, very much so want to control this in a very responsible manner. Because if we control it, we can control this public safety issues, and we can prove to the rest of the country, the rest of the world, that we can have this program, we can have our freedom, uh, and at the same time, we can reduce teen marijuana use, we can keep our roads safe, we can keep crime down. And that's the balance, I think, that we need to strike. For the record, I have only stolen three children off the street this week <laughs> as, as a dispensary owner. And, you know, I just want to say that I hope to increase that to five within the next four months. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that view, Mike. Um, you know, I think that the Cannabis Council has been very much along the same lines responsibility. It's about writing the ty right types of laws in for everyone involved, uh, not just our commerce, but also our communities. So thank you. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit here about the tax issue, the tax and funding issue that we keep hearing about. Uh, Attorney General John Southers, for those who don't know, uh, we were supposed to appropriate these taxes, first 40 million a year, to building schools. We rank 48th, 49th in education in Colorado, uh, nationwide, and we want to be able to use uh, not to harm kids from legalization of cannabis, but to help them. Um, if you could talk, Mike, a little bit about um, the uh, tax appropriation, uh, whether or not this will slow down legal sales to non-patient purchasers. Also talk a little bit about uh, the legalities of buying cannabis now and what that framework looks like. If this is legal, how do you source it? Um, and then what the, uh, the taxing options might be. And maybe, Brian, you could uh, follow up with that. Uh, one of the reasons we bring this up is because Amy Lathan, one of our county commissioners, has completely, uh, repeatedly said that we intentionally deceived voters that the, uh, the excise tax that was proposed inside of the amendment was intentionally deceiving so that that way we were, we were making sure that the voters were, were hosed. And uh, one of the things I wanna stress is that we went through how many, uh, Brian, how many reiterations of this before it was approved by the voting uh, commission or whatever? I, I mean, dozens, and, and I mean, we went through you know, reiteration after reiteration, but one of the big things that I'd really like to stress is that I'm very offended as, you know, as, a, as an advocate, as a, as a, just as anything that, that, you know, Commissioner Lathan would put it to the point and say that we intentionally deceived voters. And so I really think it's important that every single time that we address this, that we make sure that it's very clear. We went through and made sure that, that the Voting Commission approved our language they approved everything that had to go through. And so there was no, at no time ever, and any intentional deception to the voters. And every single time that we put this to anyone, we intended to have those monies go to education. And it was the Tabor laws that have, uh, have messed that up. It's not us. And so I just want to make sure that that's really clear to anyone here who has ever questioned that. So I'll, I'll let Brian take it from there. I'm sorry, Mike. Well, uh, okay, so to jump in, um, so once again, I'm a member of the, the tax funding uh, and civil law working group, and so the excise tax was the subject of our uh, meeting that we had just yesterday. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the debate here is that, you know, in our Colorado, I mean, in, in Amendment 64, it basically says that the General Assembly shall enact an excise tax that can't be more than 15% 
Um, I think that there's a deadline date of 2017, I want to say. Uh, and the, the other question, though, is that also in our Colorado Constitution is the Taxpayers' Bill of Rights, which basically says that every new tax needs to be voted on. So here we go. We've got two constitutional provisions, one saying that every new tax needs to be voted on, and the other says that, you know, the General Assembly needs, shall uh, pass a tax. And so the question that we were dealing with yesterday that I gotta be honest, we didn't really come up with a conclusion to, was, uh, you know, whether the voters actually need to approve the excise tax uh, that the General Assembly will apparently uh, pass. And, well, and then there's also the question of whether the General Assembly can be required to pass an excise tax, but I think that's kind of a stupid uh, thing to be talking about because they're gonna pass it, I think. Um, but, you know, in the Blue Book, and you know, Brian knows more about this than I do, but in the Blue Book, it basically, I think it argued that uh, uh, it does need, you know, an excise tax would need to comply with Tabor and be voted on. Uh, the arguments that were being made yesterday was, uh, screw that. Uh, it's, you know, we have it in the Constitution, it's Amendment 64, it says uh, the states, you know, the, the General Assembly needs to pass it. There's no mention of Tabor in it. And so let's just pass it and not, you know, but then, you know, there, there could be a lawsuit. I mean, Doug Bruce could be suing the state over it. Uh, so, well, we don't, I, I don't know. Brian, you can, you can go further if you think that there's more to talk about there. But let me bring up 280E real quick. Because uh, there is, I mean, my group and some others have been working on addressing 280E at the state level. And to do a quick ex explanation of 280E, this is the IRS tax code, which basically says if you are drug trafficking, you cannot take business tax deductions like uh, your rent and your payroll. So, but you know, the state of Colorado, we are coupled with the federal law, which basically means that here in the state of Colorado, uh, that federal tax provision is going to be applied to your state taxes as well. So the whole idea of the state bill is to well, it's to decouple is the word, to, to no longer have the federal rule apply in Colorado. So uh, uh, 280E wouldn't apply in Colorado, and, and then you could take those, uh, those business tax deductions like payroll and, uh, uh, and your, 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 your uh, rent fees and whatnot. Uh, that issue, though, it also is now being brought up in my working group, and uh, we decided to take it kind of an extra step, or but let me say that differently. I'm pushing this, uh, and mind you, the Attorney General's office is one of the co-chairs, so this is a really fun battle in this working group. But we're pushing to uh, have the state of Colorado, uh, basically the governor, uh, sign a letter to the federal government, basically to the president, and I believe the Department of Revenue, saying it's time to fix this problem, solve 280E, and, and tell and, and say that this does not apply to businesses that are, are in compliance with state law. And that right now is the plan. I'll tell you next week whether it works or not. <laughs> we'll see. But uh, so far, this working group has been uh, rather reasonable. And, and, and quickly, just a week ago, uh, what we did pass, and it was the first official recommendation of the task force, is this, you know, uh, some, you know, like an okay, I, I, I hesitate to say solution, uh, that's strong, but a solution to the banking problem, where it's not really a solution like we're going to allow banking, but uh, the solution would be that the governor, the attorney general, the medical marijuana industry, my, my group and any others who want to sign on, and others are signing a letter to the President of the United States, the Department of Treasury, and other state agencies saying, Fix the banking problem. And not, or, the original proposal was, and this is from the Attorney General's office, what they wanted to do was to seek guidance, which we think is kind of a bunch of crap because the guidance is gonna be, it's against federal law. And so we switched that up and said, fix the problem. And so that actually got passed. And so the first recommendation through this task force is that the governor the Attorney General, they're all going to sign this letter. It's going to go to the President of the United States. And, you know, I suppose that uh, the Governor could say no, but the full task force has recommended this. And so now we're trying to kind of take the same idea of, of getting the state, the Governor, to, to solve the 280 problem. Uh, that's kind of what we're pushing for. So who knows? It's, uh, it's a good start, I guess. Hey, hey, hey.
Yeah, just quickly, it's almost 9 p.m., so I won't bore you with that tax talk too much here, but you know, the, quickly, there will be a 15%, up to 15% excise tax on these recreational sales, right? Um, it's possible, although incredibly improbable, that the state legislature will not put that excise tax into place. Worst case scenario is this time next year, recreational users are buying marijuana without paying an excise tax. I got no problem with that, but my guess is they're they're going to pass that excise tax, and frankly, we're going to push them to pass the excise tax. That's, that was we we're very upfront about this excise tax. The fact that it would go to uh, uh, to public school construction every year. We ran, we spent millions of dollars, literally, on TV ads saying exactly that. So I don't know if the county commissioner doesn't have a TV or something, but we're very upfront about this. Um, and, and I guess just as relevant to your businesses, where this tax will take place is from the grow to the retailer. Right, and this is for the grow to Amendment 64 retailer. It will not apply uh, to medical marijuana patients if they are purchasing medical, medical, medical marijuana at an MMC, right? So we read that in there specifically just to, I guess, uh, you know, well, absolutely to support patients because we don't think they should pay any more taxes, but if you want to continue as a, just an MMC, then you will not be uh, involved in that 15% excise tax. Which means there can't be vertical integration because guarding the mic. For an owner of a social club, you do an awful lot of Bogart. Pass that shit. Um, thank you guys very much for coming down. Uh, it's a, that was a great panel, I think, and thank you all for the wonderful questions. It was a great night. I appreciate you all coming out and supporting the efforts of the council to get this information out, supporting the efforts of these groups who are working very hard to make sure that your businesses stay in business. Um, I want to speak really briefly. We sponsored the event tonight with my company, I Comply. Uh, we do help your businesses be more successful uh, by ensuring that your rules and regulations are on the same page with everybody at your staff and that you guys are all reading from the same place. Um, we're also doing a lot of work in Denver. I'm seeing Mike uh, every other day at least. So we're up there also bringing forward your voice, bringing forward certain concerns that, you know, just like this panel, we may or may not agree with at all times. Uh, but if you'd like that representation, you're looking to get more involved in crafting these rules and regulations to ensure viability for your businesses, for your industry, please come talk to us afterwards. I'd also like to give a little bit of time to Jason Love, uh, who's been working very hard on industrial hemp. I want him to take about five minutes. Yeah, absolutely. We can just talk a little bit about what's going on there, because I know everybody's got big questions, and we're like, what, this is going through this year? Is that in 2014? What's going on? So Jason will be happy to answer those. It'll take about five minutes, um, and we got a few more announcements after that. Wait, you mean people don't want to smoke now? <laughs> they try it, though. They have really big headaches. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. It's, it's awesome to see what's happening in the hemp world. And yes, we are doing this now. We actually started this a while ago, I'll say a couple of years ago. So some of you may know that I wrote HB 121099 that got passed last year, which is the Industrial Hemp Remediation Pilot Woo! Program. Thank you. That was, that was really with the assistance of uh, Representative Wes McKinley at the time, and we brought on Linda Parker and Eric Hunter onto our team. Since then, we've been working on communication, education, research, and we've learned a lot through the remediation program, which is absolutely fascinating stuff. Um, on that note, I got a call from an asphalt company last week. They wanted to know if they could use hemp oil. They use soy oil, and of course, we're doing the research right now. So, <laughs> this, is, this has been um, a whirlwind. Things are picking up speed every single day. Some of you may have seen the front page of the Denver Post. The Washington Post, Health and Science section, the list goes on. But what's happening? We're getting a lot of questions. You guys, some of you, are, I know are getting some questions from farmers or from people who may have land. And what do you do about it? Well, let me first say that uh, Senator Schwartz and um, Senator Crowder, Representative S uh, Sonnenberg, if I remember right, and I can't remember the last one, I want to say Fisher. Our, our current sponsors, we're probably going to end up with co-prime sponsors, which means two people in each seat. Um, that said, we sat down with a drafter yesterday, so we should see official language published in the next few days. 
Um, up until now, it's just been a lot of footwork and talking, communication, education, and so on and so forth. So that said, uh, what I ask of you is please contact your local representatives and encourage them um, to, to support what we're doing with the Industrial Hemp Bill. Brian Vicente and Christian Cedarberg and Josh Kappel all have been really helpful. Charles Houghton also is on our committee from the Industrial Hemp Program last year. Um, but let me answer a couple questions about what do you do when you encounter somebody who wants to grow hemp? Well, right now, we're trying to get a letter from the Attorney General, and this looks really interesting. Um, he's been supportive all of a sudden. But uh, we're trying to get a letter from him to allow emergency research with outdoor hemp projects. And we're using this um, in conjunction with HB 1099, which does not prohibit outdoor uh, research either. So that said, the next few steps um, that we have to take are really to tweak the bill. Um, you're going to see public versions of it, so obviously make your comments, get, get involved, involved in all of this. The, the bill objective, what we're really looking at right now, is something that's similar to North Dakota and Maine, uh, with a, a, ca a couple caveats to it. But it essentially says, you can grow hemp. And then there's a series of regulatory registration processes, and that's only to register your cultivar and location, and so on and so forth. From that, we're going to see what happens. Who knows what law enforcement and so on and so, so forth say. So I appreciate the opportunity to uh, share the info with you, uh, keep you up to date, and hopefully you'll see all this posted on hempcleans.com in the next week or so. We're rebuilding the website. One question. I have a gentleman that owns Joe Strawberries. He has 13 acres in uh, our, our category, rural, residential, here in El Paso County. Uh, he had a question, you know, hey, I'm not making any money. I'm running out of my, my funds. I want to sell my family. What, are there any zoning rules that we know of or anything we can suggest to him that he might be able to save his farm? That's a really good question. So there's a couple avenues to think about. There's the farming aspect in terms of harvesting, but there's also phytoremediation projects. And so if you're interested in learning more about what the opportunities are, please reach out to Hemp Cleans. Right now I know the website's very simple. Go to the contact page and, and uh, just submit your name and information and your comments about what you want addressed or your question. And uh, we've got a whole bunch of committees that have formed to address all these questions, whether it's about architecture, building, food, well, for example, children, so on and so forth. Right. So I understand that, but so so in, in, to address that in terms of the county ban, so far there are no counties that are banning hemp. That's separate. It's a separate issue. So um, in regards to that, just um, stay you know stay apprised with what we're doing. We are watching all the counties and staying in communication with all the mayors and so on and so forth. So um, if you're curious about specific areas, do reach out and we can answer those questions as well. Awesome. Hey. Oh, hold on, I want to take away from Jason in case he has got more to say, but as far as the county is concerned, I mean, just so you know, for those of you who were not able to attend the uh, meeting, uh, the county commissioners, as you know, uh, put their ban in place. They did not listen to anything that anyone said regarding the logic or the uh, uh, just their illogical position of, of, of the total ban. Jason was there, he talked about industrial hemp. But my whole thing is, is you guys each live inside of the county. And what they did is with their ban is, and, and this kills me that they didn't quite comprehend this, is that they banned their control of this, you know, of this uh, industry. So, you know, in essence, I told them, you know, no one in a, in a basement, cards or uh, taxes or, uh, you know, there's no one regulating if you're paying for it, not paying for it. But uh, regardless of that, that note, I think it's important that you and all of your patients get involved and write the county and say, look, you guys need to take control of this. By your enacting a ban, you're basically banning your control of this substance in your area. And... I think that it's important that you guys make sure that that is known. Please tell your patients. Please tell each of them, you know, first of all, the first thing they should say is don't even try and put this industrial hemp because we need industrial hemp in this county regardless. And uh, second of all is, you know, you guys really need to think about what you did because right now you, you banned your control of this substance in your county. And I really encourage all of you to write your 
write your folks. If, if you can do a, a handwritten letter, apparently it, it costs for like, you know, 70 emails. So write a handwritten letter and let them know that, look, you know, this is what you banned. You need to understand that because I don't think they ever comprehended it and I know that they didn't listen to any of us that were at the county meeting. So just, just an FYI on that respect. So please take some time, get your patients involved and tell them this county ban is a bad idea. They can reverse it. Tell them that they need to. I just have one comment, and I think um, a lot of you are familiar with the data that's being released, as well as David Reese's research, along with the two other gentlemen that um, put together um, a project from the University of Denver, was a year or so ago. Um, a lot of us presented his work last year during testimony. Unfortunately, it wasn't peer-reviewed. A lot of the data referenced what's happened in the states that have regulated medical cannabis and they've seen a decrease in teenage use. They've seen a four, 11 to 14 percent decrease in fatal car accidents, and we can go down that list. But what I want you to do is research, look out for that information. Uh, actually, go to Mark's website. I comply. I'm pretty sure he's going to either has them up there or will have those um, documents available, or we'll, we'll, we'll I'll make them available. Somebody will. So, thanks. Thank you, Jason. And best news that I think is Jason has now moved to Colorado Springs. So he is in our community, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> and we're very glad to help have him down here. Um, absolutely. Thank you for moving down here. It's awesome. It'll be the Silicon Valley of him. It's awesome. That's right. It'll be a social club gathering. Everybody's invited. As long as you're 21 and up. Um, just wanted to, to, to briefly give you guys some information. Please go see Christy on your way out before you leave. Grab some of these for your center. What this is is a document that we worked on uh, with our board, and essentially it is giving you and your patients the information they need to know about Amendment 64 versus, on the back, basically medical marijuana. What the differences are, how much you can carry, the benefits of remaining a patient, versus the benefits of 64. So keep in mind, as we approach the 64 timeframe, January uh, 2014, it's gonna be increasingly difficult to maintain your patients. You're probably already seeing that drop off. All right, when your people are tied to your plants or tied to your production, it's very important that they maintain those red cards until 2014 arrives, unless there's some sort of regulatory band-aid that we're talking about now to allow you to escape that patient to plant tracking. But again, that's going forward in the legislature. You probably want representation for that. So come talk to us about it since we're trying to design those things as we go forward to take these things in consideration. So I don't know how many of you probably thought about that, but it is going to be a concern as we approach it. So make sure your patients know that, that they stay on board with you as patients just in case, and of course, to have legal access to purchase medicine since you can't uh, actually purchase marijuana from illegal markets and without a commercial license. And finally, we also have our Cannabis Council information cards over there as well. Those are helpful to get out to your patients, put up in your center, explains who we are, what we do, and why you guys are proud to be members. Yeah. And for the last part, we need to hear from you guys to make sure that we're representing you appropriately at the state. So please contact us, info at csmcc-net.org. We will make sure that your concerns are, uh, you know, uh, addressed at the state house. We've got folks that are on the, uh, the the task force with subgroups. You know, we're constantly working to make sure that you are actually represented. Re represented. So make sure that you guys give us the information so that we can represent you properly. I don't want us going up and saying, okay, we feel like this is the best, uh, you know, uh, solution for our group, and then you guys not like that. You know, we want to make sure that we're representing you the entire way. So please, give us the information. Send us the info. Let us make sure that we're making sure that your voice is heard up there. Because I know that you guys can't afford to spend the time up there. I know I can't afford to spend the time up there. I make sure that Mark can afford to spend some time up there. But let's, let's just make sure that he's properly supported with the right information. Okay? Thanks. I believe that concludes the evening. Everybody have a great night. Thank you all for coming out. Appreciate it. Thank you to our legal panel as well. Thank you guys. Wait, 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 wait. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry. I lied, I lied.
Whoa, I, I, and I'm, I'm sorry, this is important. Because I spent, I spent literally three full meetings this morning for about six hours interviewing city council candidates. All right, so I forgot to mention this, this is kind of important. When we're talking about local regulation and implementing this, writing the right types of uh, rules and regs for our concerns, this is very important. Um, so we're meeting with folks right now to find out who's favorable to your issue. As a 501c4, the point of the Cannabis Council is to be able to endorse candidates, get voters' guides to you all so that you can put them in your centers, get your patients, you know, stuff them in your patients' bags and get this out. If we're seeing anywhere from 30 to 100 patients a day, depending on the size of your center, that's a lot of political power. And to be able to get into their bags some sort of voters' guide on who they should pick is very important. So. Having said that, we have a two-time term. I'm gonna do this like world wrestling style. <laughs> Are you ready? No, I'm just kidding. So two-time term, city councilman, Tom Gallagher wants to ask you something about this and about his potential bid. Well, oh, yeah. Oh, wait until I'm done. <laughs> um, I've been watching this council race develop. Um, there's a slate of very hostile people to your industry uh, that are very well funded. Um, what I'm here to do is float a lead balloon and see how viable my candidacy would be. I'm not because there's reporters in the audience. I'm not going to mention the district. Okay, that's going to happen when I pull the packet. Um, but, you know, the, the reality is, is am I, am I politically viable? Um, I'm going to need to raise about $25,000 to do this. Um, the bright side is that the opponents will have to raise more. Can I say one thing? Just for the record, um, without uh, Mr. Gallagher here, not any of us would be in business. That's right. So I just want to make sure that that is very, very clear. I... Uh, Unfortunately, because of term limitations, he was forced off of council in the last term. Back. And right now, he has the opportunity to come back. And when it comes back, he has a voice for the rest of us. So, just very clearly, without Mr. Gallagher, there would have been no MMJ industry in Colorado Springs. And that's where I agree with you with freedom. Uh, unfortunately, 60 Minutes didn't. Chuck was at that meeting. And I explained exactly to the producers how Marijuana stores popped up in one of the most conservative communities on the planet. And that's because you told us to. Okay, it's, it's that fundamental, and we're going to see this kind of friction um, because government doesn't like to give up the power to the people. Government has assumed the role where it believes it's the overseer and it dictates, and it's our job to fund and obey. And, and that's just not this country. And that's how I sold my colleagues on the city council to approve our ordinances. I use their conservative values against them. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, 60 Minutes figured that that argument on national television would ignite a fire that would sweep across this country. <laughs> um, because it is about freedom. And it's about respecting you guys. I mean, I've read the document many times. I've crossed my eyes. I've shook it upside down. Um, there's a Santa Claus in there somewhere. And that's where all these oppressive powers exist. Um, I've demonstrated for eight years. I take the shots. I take the heat. Um, I stand on principle. And I'm a known quantity. Um, so I will be sitting off in the alcove or something <laughs> after this. Um, those of you that are interested in supporting me, please come by. Because I, I can't tell you, it's, it's, it's scary. And Charles can attest. Um, under the city charter, what one council does, it doesn't bind future councils. And if the slate of hand-picked people get in, you're going to be out of business. Because as Colorado Springs City Council allowed you, they can unallow you, and they can do it that quick. You saw what happened at the county commissioner's meeting. Um, it was sad. It, well, it, and it's, I don't understand how it can pass in the county, because Colorado Springs is part of the county. Without Colorado Springs, eastern El Paso County becomes a third world country. Yeah. Okay, all their tax revenue comes from Colorado Springs, but for purposes of their decision, they just took 420,000 people out of the equation. And uh, that's how politics is played in El Paso County. 
That's how politics used to be played in Colorado Springs. And there's a very real risk that that's what we're going back to. Is it a coincidence that it was 420? <laughs> 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 Folks, just, uh, just for the record, just so you know, the things that we've done with the city thus far is we have been able to stave a, a ban vote until after this, the state has put together their, uh, their regulations and their rules. Mind you, they will revisit this once the rules are made. Just so that you guys can put that in perspective, the rules will not be complete until the end of May. Our new city council will come into play in April. So therefore, all the people that are on city council right now will not be on city council in May. So, we need to start looking at candidates, we need to start putting people on council that work with us, that are able to uh, uh, get everything done that we need to get done. So, this is a very pivotal time for us. And because the council is a 501c4 organization, we can and we will endorse and unendorse candidates. So, I want it to be very clear that everyone who's on city council right now will not be the deciding factor in your fate. So just be very clear about that. So thanks. <laughs> Carlos, I'm going, to, I'm going to criticize you, Mr. Vincente. How dare you subject a constitutional right to the whims of a local vote? That should have never been in the amendment um, because it is contrary to the whole concept of the Constitution. That being said, I'm glad that it turned out the way it did. <laughs> Thank you everyone who turned out tonight. Thank you for staying those extra few minutes and uh, thank you for everything that we've got going on going forward. What's your piece of this puzzle? Uh,